All right. Hello everyone, the Instant Camera Guy here. Uh, new year, a new workshop. Uh, for those that don't know already, I have just finished my interstate move from Victoria back to my home state of Western Australia, where I've just spent the last several days uh, building a new temporary workshop for myself uh, whilst I look for another house. Uh, but in the meantime, I am back up and running. And obviously, uh, as you can see from this video, this is gonna be a year of new things. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was start putting a lot more of my content on YouTube uh, for various different reasons, uh, but mainly just because Facebook, which is where I've been previously uh, live streaming a lot of repairs and uh, basically putting up a lot of Polaroid related information is just becoming increasingly uh, irrelevant over the years as a social media platform. There's not a lot of interaction there anymore and the interaction that is there is pretty much only from uh, diehard fans that have been following me for, <laughs> you know, the last decade or so. So I wanted to see what would happen if I branch out. Uh, so as always, um, for those that may be new to this channel, uh, I am a repairman. I've been fixing Polaroid cameras, uh, fixing Polaroid cameras for pff, well over a decade at this point. I've got somewhere between 15 to 13 years of experience um, fixing instant cameras of all various types. Uh, and if you want me to fix your camera, feel free to get in touch. All of my links to social medias are down the bottom. Uh, I'm happy to service whatever you might have, provided I've got the knowledge to do it. So feel free to send something in to me. But today we're gonna to be focusing on this. Uh, this is a camera of mine that was gifted to me uh, by a follower of mine who actually, I actually met up with while I was in Amsterdam on holiday. Uh, he actually met up with me uh, and gifted me this. He said I could take it home and do what I liked with it. Uh, and so I figured what I would do is uh, modify this thing to take iType. Uh, it is a classic Polaroid 1000 with the Polartronic flash. Uh, the Polaroid 1000 is the exact same as the Polaroid One Step. They're identical cameras, it's just that in Europe the camera was known as the 1000. In America they called it the One Step, otherwise they're completely identical. And of course, uh, this camera is famous for being the one that Instagram initially borrowed its logo design from. Uh, it's a very cheap cheerful camera, single element plastic meniscus lens. It is designed to take SX70 film and it has the desirable Q-Light flash. The Q-Light is fairly desirable because, uh, well, it matches, so it keeps up that entire uh, rainbow coloring scheme. But the, rain, the um, uh, flash is actually quite powerful. It features a, a sort of unique adjustment. So you've got a light dark slider uh, and a little photo sensitive diode on the flash that adjusts flash power based on uh, distance and light information received back. Um, and so it's, a, it's quite a capable little camera despite the fact that it is uh, a fixed focus little design. Um, and basically uh, what I'll be doing to it today is modifying it uh, to make it just that even more capable. We're going to be using, uh, we're going to be modifying it to take iType film instead of SX70 film. And the reason for doing that, well, first of all, uh, is that iType film is a lot cheaper. Um, iType film is effectively Polaroid 600 film, but it doesn't have the battery built into the pack. so. Uh, whereas a regular pack of film has little uh, cutouts for battery terminals down here uh, that would basically power the camera internally. iType film doesn't have that, it's just completely blank at the bottom. So that means we're going to need to find an external power source for this camera. Um, but as a result of that battery not being in there, iType film is certainly far cheaper. You can actually pick up an entire five pack of film for about 30 Australian dollars less than you would be paying uh, for the equivalent 600 film. So the way to think about that is basically every five pack that you buy, you're effectively getting a pack for free compared to shooting 600 film. Um, the other big advantage that you get is you get a lot more film ISO. So it's a higher sensitivity film. Uh, SX70 film is only 160 ISO. 600 film is 640 ISO, so four times faster. 
uh, meaning four times better in low light environments. Uh, and you would actually be surprised at what this thing is capable of when you give it some faster film. Uh, the lens on this is only about a 106 mil f14, something like that, if memory serves correct. I hope I'm remembering that right. Um, so not particularly capable if you're just shooting SX-70 film. And f14 with 160 ISO means that you're basically limited to, unless you use the flash, if you don't have the flash, you're limited to basically bright, sunny days only. Uh, so let's change that. Let's rip this thing apart, alter it, and uh, yeah, basically get it working with iType film. So one of the things that we're going to need to do is obviously power the camera. So I've got a little AAA battery pack here that I'm going to use. Um, and that'll get us halfway there. That'll obviously allow us to power the, the film eject. Um, but what it won't do is change the, uh, the shutter because we're basically going to need to be making the shutter much faster than it already is to compensate for the fact that the film is faster. So we're going to need to speed up that shutter by a factor of four. Um, and uh, basically the way that I'm going to do that is by electronically modifying the shutter. So we're going to be replacing the main integration cycle capacitor with one that is uh, a quarter of the value. And what that'll do is speed the shutter up by a factor of four, thus compensating for the film. Uh, now you might argue and say, well, what if I just wanted to use a, uh, a filter instead? Well, of course you could. You could use a little pack film filter, uh, such as one of these made by Retrospect, and that would stop down the light enough to reach the film. Um, but in my opinion, it really defeats the purpose of shooting eye type, which is that higher speed. Um, I'm not really interested in just saving a bit of money. I also want the high performance as well. So uh, that's basically what we'll be doing. Um, as far as I know, I'm the first person to have ever really documented these plastic cameras. These things tend not to get a lot of attention um, because I think people, well, I think what people, what people do is they end up using one of these things without a flash, get horribly blurry photos because they're stuck on SX-70 film. And uh, these are sort of relegated to the category of toy as a result of that, uh, which I don't think is very fair. So without further ado, let's just get to work, rip this thing apart and start the modification process. So first thing that I'm gonna do is just get that rainbow faceplate off. Just put that to the side. I'll also just remove the button, take that to the side. And the other thing that needs to come out is the viewfinder. And then it is a matter of, with a bit of force, uh, you'll always feel like you're gonna break one of these things when you, <laughs> when you start to open one up. Um, effectively, the one-step series, well, really starting at the one-step series and then going on to the 600 series, these cameras were designed in a way that they didn't use any screws to hold them together. Uh, they are entirely held in place with little plastic clips. Uh, now, sometimes they come apart easily. Other times they need a little bit of persuasion. This one is certainly having a hard time getting itself free. <laughs> dear, oh dear. This one's really jammed in there. But it will come out. Eventually. There we go. Yeah, sometimes it just takes a bit of a uh, a bit of convincing to release it. Now, that is as far as I have to strip down the camera for this procedure. Uh, I gotta take the little light dark wheel apart in just a minute. But really, these things, once you start stripping down the shutter to any more than this particular uh, assembly, it gets really difficult really quickly. And if you don't believe me, try and do it for yourself. Try and take apart the shutter and put it back again together. Um, the reason it's so difficult is those clips, they're kind of one way. They're designed to be pressed together once and then never again. <laughs> These were cheap cameras. Um, they were not designed with repair in mind, uh, but they were designed very simply and as a result, very reliably. 
So they tend not to break in the first place, but if they break um, and you need to do repairs beyond sort of what it looks like here, it does get very quick, uh, very difficult, very fast. Um, now what I'm gonna do is, what we need access to is this little capacitor on the side, this little green guy. We gotta remove that and then replace that with one of an appropriate value. Now I happen to know from experience that these little green capacitors are uh, four, no, uh, 200 picofarads. They are actually the same type of capacitor that Polaroid used in the 680. Completely identical. So if you look up a, if you have a look at a Polaroid 680 uh, PCB, that is what you'll discover. All right, so I'm just peeling that back. I'm gonna turn on my desoldering gun. Uh, and basically what I'm going to be doing is removing that capacitor and then replacing it with one that is, I mean, the original is about 200 picofarads, so I'm going to be putting one in here that is basically 50. And, well, 200 divided by 4 is 50, so that's the right value that we need. All right. Get out of here. There we go. Now, I am just going to bend the legs uh, to make it fit in a lot easier. So I'm just doing this while my desoldering gun is heating up. I probably should have thought ahead and had it running nice and hot, but that's okay. Uh, I do apologize if I sound all sniffly, by the way. Um, I ended up coming back from Europe as the capacitor. If it wants to focus, there we go. Yeah, I ended up coming back from Europe with a utterly horrendous, I don't know, cold, influenza, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was literally out for five days. Like, four days of which was just purely spent in bed, unable to really do anything. Uh, whilst I'm waiting for that, I'll also just give everything just a bit of a clean. Now, this particular example of the one step is like I would say mink condition like other than a little bit of dust on the viewfinder uh, like the front panel here everything about this is incredibly clean there's no dust on the mirror assembly I just checked right so the mirror is completely spotless in there uh, really really clean so I don't really need to do a lot to this camera uh, in order to get it working um, other than the mods that I need to do. Everything else is in good working order. I've also tested it and it does actually function. So literally nothing wrong with this camera. Unlike their uh, folding camera cousins, the uh, SLR series SX-70s, which are basically guaranteed to be riddled with problems by now, uh, these cameras are actually particularly reliable. They're quite invulnerable in terms of design and that means that you can pretty much guarantee if you pick one up that it's it's got a very high likelihood of, of working without really needing to do a lot. Um, quite often these get very dusty inside. This one is fine, but that is something to be aware of if you end up getting a lot of black spots on your, uh, on your photos. Uh, desoldering gun is nearly done. What I'm gonna do as well, in the body there are these two, two springs. It's a little hard to see in the shadows. But what these springs do is those springs are actually there to prevent you from inserting the wrong pack of film. Uh, they don't do anything, so they're not essential. Uh, and we aren't going to be using them because we want to be able to put any type of film we want. And so we're just going to remove them and I'll just dust the insides of the body. Uh, even the little glass window for the film counter is like spotless. I really, I really can't emphasize, I hope this comes up on, uh, on the video, but I can't emphasize just how clean this thing is. It's really, really a nice example. So thank you, Tony, uh, for uh, sending this to me. 
Uh, I really appreciate it. It was very nice to meet you, by the way, when we were in Amsterdam. So, all right. Okay. Now I've got my desoldering gun, and what this should do. Hopefully, this gun has survived the voyage. Great. Uh, it actually sounds a little blocked. So I'm just going to give it a, a little clean. This is the first time powering this thing up after the move. I hope it uh, didn't become a casualty, but I can't hear anything sucking <laughs> through the gun. The vacuum appears to be working, so it must have some kind of a blockage. Alright, well, we'll just go plan B. That is fine. All right, plan B. All right, plan B is to just use regular old wick. This is the other way that you can remove solder from things. Trim the end off that. The desoldering gun does do a better job of this. So it is my preferred method. But I will need to diagnose and figure out why my desoldering gun doesn't work at the moment. There you go, that's one capacitor removed. The reason I prefer to use the desoldering gun for this very uh, modification is obviously it's not a consumable. Wick is. Wick works by basically sucking solder away from whatever it's attached to. So let's say it's on a PCB. Uh, wick being coated in a layer of flux and being made of copper. Uh, basically the solder has a preference. It would rather stick to this than whatever it's touching. Uh, and so the solder moves up off whatever you're working on and onto the wick instead. So eventually the wick will become all used up, but I've got heaps of it left at the moment. All right, now we want to put in the new capacitor. Uh, for those that have been following me for a while, let me know what you think of the new camera setup, by the way. And what you think of the channel. Uh, I'll be looking for, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'll be looking for new ideas, things to cover, um, ways to improve. Um, but the way that I want to operate this channel, I want it to be very, very low effort. Uh, I want most of the things that I do, because it's just the way that I work and the way that I've become used to it, I want these videos to be done pretty much in a single take, or as close to a single take as I can possibly get. Reason being, less editing for me to do, because editing takes an impossibly long period of time, and I would much rather be fixing cameras than editing videos. Uh, but also, when you do videos fairly live like this, like when you do these videos kind of blind, they're more entertaining. I watch a lot of repair videos that are out there. Uh, people like Adrian's Digital Basement, uh, people like Necroware, um, and they are very entertaining to watch because diagnosis is where all the fun happens. Uh, otherwise, you're basically just watching an instructional video, and I ain't about that. I want people to get entertained by what I'm doing. 
And if that means that they're tuning in and halfway through my repair video, my desoldering gun isn't working, well, great. That's all part of the fun. All right, so that new capacitor is installed. Uh, I'm gonna give that lens just a little dust. And uh, yeah, we can basically put this to the side. That is now 600 modified, and now we can start work on the battery compartment. Now the battery compartment we will need to modify. Reason being, it has an on-off switch, uh, but the on-off switch is located on the surface of the camera, uh, on the surface of the battery pack, I should say, that I want to stick to the camera. So it's made up of two halves, you've got a sliding door, and then you've got the actual guts of the battery pack that hold everything in. Uh, and that's the part that some genius decided to put the switch into. So the switch, if I stick this to the camera as it is, uh, well, there'll be no way to access that switch, and I do want to use that switch. So I'll show you why in just a second. So what I'm going to do is just take this switch box apart and just modify it just change the location so that that switch basically is reversed and faces uh, internally instead. So it's a little bit annoying, um, but it's just something that I have to do when I, re when I use these uh, type of battery boxes. And they just, they don't make them any other way. It's just the way that it is. All right, now one of the things I do have to do is just drill a hole in the uh, battery box here. And that's gonna allow me to uh, poke the wires through the inside of the camera. Now we're gonna be mounting this battery box on the sloped rear surface of the camera. So it is gonna go about here. And that is really the best location for it. It really doesn't add any extra size to the footprint of the camera. It keeps it really compact. We're still gonna be able to put the uh, top flash housing on. And the ABS plastic of the battery holders that I keep in stock is identical to the Polaroid One Step's original plastic. So what that means is the camera ends up looking really, really original, which is great. Now, I'm just gonna drill this hole right about there, just off screen. I'm just going to dangle it off my bench so that I'm not drilling into wood. Uh, there we go. And I'm just going to find a slightly larger bit for that as well, just to make that hole a little bit bigger. All right. Perfect. All right, now what I can do, um, we're gonna need <coughs> an extra bit of cable, which I'm, I'm actually gonna recycle. This is a, a fan header <laughs> from an old PC computer fan that was broken. Um, I like to recycle wherever I can because there is so much e-waste in this world already, like without me adding to it. Um, and cables, like they don't really go bad. So if you have a stash of cables, feel free to recycle them and cut them down and repurpose them. It's gonna save you having to go out and buy extra bits of wire. So one of the things I'm gonna be doing to this switch assembly uh, is first of all, modifying the way that the battery spring holder is attached. So I'm just gonna add what I like to do, again, recycling. I like to keep these tiny little, I don't even know if you guys can see that, these tiny little metal legs. Um, and these legs come off of capacitors when I trim them. So when I install a new capacitor, you guys probably just saw me trimming down those little legs. I like to reuse those because they are perfect for extending the legs that attach these little battery springs.
So I've just soldered that on to the original spring assembly. Whoa, hot, hot, hot. Hot, hot, hot. Now what we can do... Yeah. Is... Run that down. Like so. And then through and onto that other side of the switch. piece of wire so one of these wires is going to be for connecting the batteries to the negative like the negative part of the battery to the negative part of the um, camera's battery circuitry uh, the other wire is going to go to the camera's built-in like pack film battery uh, so that basically when the when you flick the switch your camera is going to be able to choose from either a built-in internal battery like you would find on a pack of 600 or SX70 uh, or you can use the triple A's so it's gonna have the option to do either and that is yeah basically what I'm looking for in the end is a little spring with the switch attached to it and the two wires coming off and so now we can reinstall this. Uh, again, you guys will see in a second that the way that I've installed it, the spring and the switch assembly is now in backwards, right? So instead of the switch being toggled here, it's now internal, which I think is a much neater way of doing it. Uh, and it's certainly gonna help us install it onto the camera. I'm just gonna use the soldering iron to melt down the two plastic lugs that hold on the switch. That's gonna stop it from wobbling around. There we go. And that's nearly the end of all the soldering. We're nearly done uh, with all the soldering that we're gonna to need to do today. I'm just gonna reattach positive battery wire and now we can start to attach everything together so the way that I'm going to mount this to the camera is through the use of automotive uh, double-sided body molding tape now this tape is very very strong it's designed to hold panels of cars on as they travel down the motorway at high speeds uh, and it's designed to, you know, be exposed to all kinds of pretty, pretty extreme weathers. And this kind of tape, I don't, if you've ever used it, you'll know exactly what it's like. But basically, once you put those two halves together, they ain't coming apart. So it's a really good way of mounting the battery pack to the camera without needing additional screws or anything like that. Um, I did wonder at first if I should be attempting to track down screws or anything like that to attach it more properly, but honestly, it's just not necessary. This is more than strong enough. All right. So I just gotta get the, the rear tape off and then we can stick it down. Now when I stick this down, I'm not going to do it directly centered. So the temptation might be, for reasons of aesthetics, 
uh, to put that battery pack in there mounted perfectly centered right so you know it sits smack back smack in the middle of that um sloped surface but i'm not i'm going to put it slightly offset to the right the reason for that although this particular camera is going to be using the polytronic flash which clips on certain flashes and certain accessories clip onto the viewfinder piece right on the side and if you put the battery holder in the center it means that the clip that is close to the the battery holder the clip that goes around the viewfinder can't actually go on and i would like this camera to be able to use be be used with any accessory that a client might want to put on it so that means i'm going to be, be slightly offsetting the battery holder just a little bit So I'm putting it on very lightly to begin with, just to make sure it's all square and then I'll be pressing it down. Easy. And then the drill comes out for the last time because I've got to now drill through the body of the camera. of all the plastic and uh, yeah there we go now it's just a matter of poking the wires through on the inside and then we can start to wire everything up everything in place. Now what I'm going to do is just strip the ends, ready to be soldered. The battery terminals that are already on the camera, Polaroid used various different methods um, to secure them. Sometimes they solder them in place, other times they crimp it. This one is soldered. I'm gonna see if I can just melt the solder and pull out the black wire, otherwise I'll trim it off. Nope, oh, there we go. It came straight out, which is great. That's what I like to see. Now, from memory, I believe I've got to wire this black to black and yellow is going to go to the negative terminal. I'm just going to check that with a multimeter on continuity mode. So, just listening for the beep. Yep, all right, so black to black is the way that I need to wire this up. I'm going to get a little bit of heat shrink. as well during my move that I actually need to buy some new butane cigarette lighters so because I need to shrink that heat shrink I'm actually just gonna 
let that little Zippo lighter soak in there for a second. Uh, so that I have a lighter to use. Usually I have a, a pile of little butane lighters. But I do not, because I've just moved states. And it's amazing the little things that you think you have stock of. But it's not until you go to start repair that you go, Oh dear, I don't have my usual lighters in front of me. Hope that this now works. Yay! All right. All right. Excellent. Um, yeah, good idea. Always have a backup. Like have backup tools. Uh, if you're going to be doing repair, you never know when you're going to need them. All right. Now. I'm going to be soldering the yellow wire to the negative, the negative internal battery terminal, and the red we're going to solder to where the red wire already is, so it's the positive battery terminal. And then we're ready to basically put this thing back together and give a bit of a film test. extra and uh, yeah so we have the internal mechanism of the camera and the rear with the battery holder now mated together now the tricky part is getting it all back together again and doing so neatly of course so I'm gonna get all those bits effectively like so And what we need to do is put the door on. And very important, that little film door opening latch needs to go on as you put the body of the camera together. Uh, if you forget that part, <laughs> your life is not gonna be very fun because it's very hard to get the body apart when that film door is closed. So, I do not recommend you do that. Alright, oops. Speaking of, it just fell. I'm just trying to make sure that all the cables are tucked in nicely when this thing goes together. Sure, nothing showing great. All right. Red button on. Oh, I love that noise, don't you? All right, now, first step, let's see 
that it works. Now, obviously it's not powered on right now because it's switched to triple A's and there aren't any. But if we put the switch to the side, we can see that it's now powered off internal 600 film. Uh, now what I'm gonna do is basically take that uh, and then put some triple A's inside. Now I have some rechargeable lithium ion triple A's. One of this needs a charge, the other does not. So I'm just gonna quickly measure the voltage and figure out which is which. Yeah, this is showing nothing. So this is the dead set. Yep, and that's the set that's alive. So, Basically, what I can do now, I can power it on the batteries. And there we go. So switch to the right. Can you guys hear the difference? That's using the batteries since these are lithium ion and very powerful. And this is the internal film pack. Batteries, film pack, there you go. Now there's one more thing that we have to do, uh, and I'll probably do it off camera, but that is we need to modify the flash, because this flash is way too powerful for 600 film. We actually need to reduce the amount of light coming out of it by a factor of four. Well, you remember that filter material I was talking about before? If we do that, that'll correct for the flash. So what I'm actually gonna do is open this flash up, uh, take out the lens for the flash, and I'm actually gonna cut this filter into a little rectangle and put that internally behind the lens to reduce the light the appropriate amount. But I think this video has been long enough. Uh, if you guys wanna see me do that flash mod in a future video, let me know and I'll take it apart. Um, but otherwise, I'm gonna get this done off camera. Uh, the last thing to do, obviously, is to calibrate this and make sure that it is exposing correctly for the Type 600 film. And the best way to do it, of course, is to put some film through it. Um, one other thing I wanna show you guys before I fi finally finish this video uh, is something odd happens when you modify these things to run off triple, uh, triple A's. And basically what happens is if you close the door of the camera, whilst there's power in the batteries and there's no pack of film in here, this happens. Now the reason for that is the film counter mechanism expects a pack of film to be in there when the camera is powered. That's basically the dark slide eject mechanism attempting to find the dark slide and eject it. Of course, there's nothing to be found. Now, don't worry, it's not gonna break the camera or anything like that. What you would have to do, let's say hypothetically you own one of my iType modified cameras, You've accidentally taken your old empty pack out and you close the door. You just simply open the door, take your old empty pack, and now it's reset. So you just simply put the empty pack in, close the door, wait for it to cycle back to normal, and 
putting your new pack in. You just can't close the door while it's uh, got nothing in it. You'd, so when you're using the camera like that, just keep the old pack of film in there at all times. It's totally fine. All right, guys, it is the next day, and I ended up uh, actually finishing the uh, matching flash that goes with this iType camera. Um, basically, I disassembled the entire flash and I tinted the lens cell where the flash uh, brightness is emitted from. And effectively what that does is it reduces the brightness of the flash by two stops, the same as what I modified the shutter. Um, and basically what that means is now whether you use the flash or whether you take the flash off the camera and just use it as automatic mode, uh, you're gonna be exposing for 640 ISO film, regardless of what uh, which one you use. So very, very handy stuff. Uh, and I figured I would just end the video by showing you guys a few sample photos of exactly uh, what this camera is capable of. So if I can just get the camera to focus. Um, this is just shot from the balcony of where I am, uh, overlooking nice pale blue sky, um, pretty decent detail in the road. Uh, and just really nice colors. Um, this is a little yellow mini moke just in the shadows. Uh, if I can get the camera to focus, there we go. Uh, and then lastly, I got my wife to take this uh, rather ridiculous photo of myself. Uh, but yeah, all shot on the uh, uh, July batch of the latest iType film. So that's, uh, I think, 0723 was this particular batch. Uh, as you guys can see from the samples, just really really nice vivid colors. Um, and you guys can see just how much more capable even a simple box type camera can be once they are converted to take eye type film uh, instead of relatively slow 600, uh, relatively slow SX70 film, I should say. Um, so yeah, that should conclude this video. Um, as always, uh, please feel free to share everything that I do. Um, it really does help out if you like it and subscribe. Um, at the time of me releasing this video, uh, I think this is my first video that I'm releasing on the platform. So in the infancy of this particular channel, any like, interaction or comment that I get really does help me out by uh, just promoting my reach. Um, and ultimately, if you'd like me to service one of your cameras, maybe you want me to iType mod uh, a plastic rigid bodied camera like a one step, uh, maybe you'd like me to add that battery compartment to just a simple 600 type camera, that's certainly doable too. Uh, or maybe you want something like an SX70 overhauled and serviced, uh, please slide into just one of the um, various ways of contacting me below and uh, we can get talking. You know, the, um, you know, you might even see one of your cameras in one of my future videos. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone that uh, has been following me, that continues to do so. Uh, I really couldn't do what I do without your support. And a big thank you again to Tony Graham, who donated this camera to me. Um, I hope you found this entertaining and uh, I'll see you in the next video.